Good day. My name is uh, Paul Beckwith. I teach in Ottawa at both the University of Ottawa and Carleton University. In the geography departments, I teach uh, courses like climatology, meteorology, oceanography, also uh, environmental issues uh, courses. In a couple of recent videos, I discussed a book that I just finished reading that was just released. It's by uh, a physicist, uh, Jeffrey West, and the book is called Scale. So here's the book here. And it's about the universal laws of growth, innovation, sustainability, and the pace of life in organisms, cities, economies, and companies. So it's all about how you can take the smallest mammal, a shrew or a mouse, and you can look at how the systems work in such an animal. So you have, what sort of systems do you have uh, in, in, such a, in such a mammal? You have a circulatory system, which starts basically at the heart, which uh, pumps blood through the lungs, the blood's oxygenated, and then it's distributed through smaller and smaller blood vessels down to the very, very smallest, finest capillaries, which, so, so these blood vessels basically fill the animal. They space fill the animal and they bring the oxygenated blood to all of the cells of the body. And then the oxygen is removed from the blood and the veins return the blood back to the heart, back to larger and larger um, pipes, if you like, or tubes, you know, in the, in the body and um, then that blood is, is, is pumped back through the lungs, reoxygenated, and, and the process repeats. So the key factors are that the, at the heart, you have the largest plumbing diameter, if you like, you know, the arteries, large, largest diameter in the body, and you get to smaller and smaller um, tubes, which branch off in increasing numbers, to fill the space of the, of the animal. So you get the idea. There's also a respiratory system in the animal uh, where, where you get, uh, you know, the air going in, into the lungs, etc., and back out. Okay, so there's these different systems and there's a metabolic rate, if you like, which is the sum total of all the chemical reactions that are occurring and when you have, okay, so th that would be a, a sort of a power, if you like. Now, what happens when we go to larger um, mammals, for example? You know, we go up in size, we reach humans, we go up even larger to, say, elephant. So everything is scaled up. You know, obviously the heart is much larger, much more powerful, and the diameter of the, of the arteries and the aorta is much, much larger, okay? But the principles are the same. The blood goes through the lungs, is oxygenated, and then is circulated around through the entire volume of the elephant, going to larger and, lar going to larger, and larger numbers of branches coming off and smaller and smaller diameters until you reach the fine capillaries at the end of the line and those space fill the elephant and they deliver the oxygenated blood to all the cells of the body. And then the deoxygenated blood goes back through and goes to larger and larger diameter piping, if you like, smaller and smaller in number. Then it's collected into the biggest veins of the animal, goes back through the heart, and then the process uh, repeats. And it's also got the respiratory system. So, it's very, very interesting. What Jeffrey West has done is he's examined how things scale in the animal. For example, how the metabolic rate or the total, sum total of all the chemical reactions that occur in the organism um, equates to a certain amount of energy. Um, and this metabolic met metabolism or metabolic rate scales as as the uh, mass to the three-quarter power. So what happens is, is the process gets um, more and more um, 
the process as you, as you scale up okay as you scale up then the process you get a, a sort of economy of scale and you don't need so 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 there's a power law involved it's not linear scaling it's it's sublinear if the exponent is less than one or superlinear if the exponent is greater than one and certain parts of the animal scale sublinearly and other parts scale superlinearly so basically and the the actual energy consumed in the animal or the metabolic rate um, actually has a like any other chemical reaction there's a temperature dependent and if you google Arrhenius this chemist you know a long time ago came up with the sort of a Boltzmann factor or an exponential dependence on temperature so in other words, if you increase the temperature, uh, if you if you increase the temperature that the organism is of the, of the environment in which the organism lives by 10 degrees Celsius, then the metabolic rate or the energy consumption of the animal doubles. So if you increase the temperature, the global average temperature, two degrees Celsius, which is the band of increase, a considered safe increase from the Paris Climate Agreement in, in uh, 2015, then that two degrees represents an increase in metabolic rate of 20 to 30 percent. In other words, the pace of life speeds up, if you like, for this organism. Now the reason why this is important is because for most animals, the there, there's some there's some sort of constant number of heartbeats in a lifetime um, most animals have a lifetime of about a billion heartbeats humans are an exception we have on average 2.21 billion heartbeats in our lifetime chickens are also an exception they have about 2.17 billion heartbeats in their lifetime but most other animals are about 1 billion so the problem is, is that as the temperature is increased, our metabolic rate will increase, say that 20% for a two degrees Celsius rise. So our pulse rate, our heartbeat will beat faster. And it, when our heart beats faster, then basically we're speeding up the internal clock or the pace of life. So if our heartbeat is suddenly beating 20% faster, for most of our life, then we'll reach that 2.21 billion heartbeats on average faster in a shorter amount of time. So instead of living to about, on average, say a 75 year lifespan, knock off 20% of 75 years, and we're talking about 15 years or so of reduction down to a, a lifespan of 60 years. This is just for, you know, the, a two degree Celsius rise. Now it's a bit more complicated than that because we have endotherms, which are animals that regulate their internal body temperature. So humans and birds are good examples. We'll talk about mammals. You know, most mammals are regulate their internal body temperature. So when the environment, surrounding environment, is about the temperature of your body temperature, well, the, the basically, if the temperature is too low, then your body will have to burn a lot of energy, increasing the metabolic rate, in order to keep the temperature, the internal temperature, stable. When the temperature is too hot, uh, then your body will have to spend a lot of energy to try to cool itself to keep that stable temperature. So the environmental temperature does affect the metabolic rate for, for uh, endotherms that self-regulate body temperature. For ectotherms, like lizards, snakes, reptiles, their body takes on the temperature of the surrounding environment. So if the temperature is cooler, their metabolic rate or energy burn is slower. If the temperature is larger, like any other chemical reaction, the reactions will proceed at a faster rate 
and the energy production or the metabolic rate of that creature will increase. So this is a crucial factor for ecosystems, the temperature, the surrounding temperature. And this is why, this is something that I haven't really heard too much about as far as climate change is concerned. So as global average temperatures increase, basically the pace of life or the metabolic rate increases, therefore the lifespan decreases of organisms. Now, one thing that we're seeing is mass migrations of species as the planet is warming, because the warming is non-uniform. The, the, the Arctic is warming at an incredibly fast rate compared to anywhere else on the planet. So, as, but, so but basically, um, what happens is there's a latitudinal dependence to the temperature right? It's generally very, very hot at the equator, colder as you go towards the poles. So when the equator gets too hot for species that are comfortably living there, these species, either their metabolic rates go up and their life cycle changes and they're very, they're at risk to mass mortalities of creatures, for example, fish, if the water gets too warm or birds or things, but what they do is they will migrate, they will move closer towards the poles to try to find an environment that is more conducive to what they're used to. So we're getting either, we're getting a mass migration of creatures towards the poles, towards the cooler regions, as they try to adjust to the very rapid changes from climate change. Now, some of the other very interesting factors, and I highly recommend this book, you know, it's written by a physicist, but, you know, it's a book, it's written for the general public. Although, you know, I read the book quite thoroughly, took lots of notes and stuff. You know, this is uh, my third video where I'm touching on it because it's got some very crucial um, connections to climate change. But I'll be reading it again because there's lots of things that, um, there's lots of information. I mean, Jeffrey West is at the Santa Fe Institute um, he set up an institute many years ago with other people, you know, and it's all to look at complexity. We're, we're a, complex systems and how different behaviors in these systems are emergent. There's different emergent properties. And it's not just organisms, for example, you know, but it, do, it does explain, for example, you know, why, why mammals, like why, you know, our, your baby grows like crazy, grows like a weed, um, and then in adulthood basically stops growing and it has to do with that energy from the metabolic rate, how it's divided into growth and how it's divided into, how it's segmented into growth and maintenance of cells and um, repair of cells. So when a baby is very small, there's very little repair and maintenance of cells in the body required, so that energy can all go into growth. As the baby matures into a, a teenager, an adult, then there's more and more volume of the body. There's more and more maintenance required and repair of cells. So there's, a, there, there's basically no energy left over for growth and growth halts and you're a fully, um, you're, you're an adult. And then basically as time goes on, there's more and more maintenance required and more and more repair required and eventually your body can't produce enough energy and you basically slow down and uh, you know you eventually die so that's sort of the process so there's a lot of deep insights from from this scaling information and a lot of it can also apply to cities you know why are cities so popular why are they basically the very very largest cities the mega cities in the world are scaled up versions of smaller cities if you double the size of a city, for example, you don't just double the patent, you double the patent and add on another 15% or so. Um, crime rates go the same way. Um, you know, and this is because the networks in cities are plumbing and electricity and piping. Uh, you can talk about companies scaling, you know, based on the org charts. 
You can talk about social interactions increasing, so cities becoming more efficient and so on. So scaling is a, is a fascinating concept that has 